we so much love you. We adore you, Lord Jesus. We say thank you, Father. Because there's none like you. You've kept us alive. And we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for your benevolence, your provision, your protection, your love, your favor, your loving kindness that has been over us. We thank you for everything. We return all the glory to your name. And Lord, we ask in this service this morning that you speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Let the word we need to hear come this morning. Take control of this service. Let our lives never remain the same again. We worship you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. I can hear your voice. Can you shout hallelujah? This service is going to be awesome. This service is going to be powerful. God is coming your way this morning. Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you excited to be in church this morning? Somebody's not excited. I said, are you excited to be in church this morning? Excited. Amen. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. So church is not that place you come to form. You know how you form. Those form, package. No, church is the place where there is liberty in the spirit. Where you express your joy to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's not a place where you come looking like Lucusid, as cool as Kukumba, sitting like sitting room. <laughs> it's a place where you let yourself just let your heart worship God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's any place to be free. We see the presence of God. Amen. So this morning we are looking at a topic titled The Way to the Cross. And it is a message that is very important. Relevant to everybody, every man, every woman. Married couples, singles, students, workers. This message is relevant to all of us and I like us to pay a lot of attention. I also like us to get our writing materials, get some notes down, get some scriptures, references written down, so that you can be like a Berean Christian, so you can get back home and check these scriptures and look at them over and again. Because the first time you hear a message, you can absorb everything. So you need to go back to it and read it and study it. Any believer, any child of God that comes to church without the writing notes is an irresponsible child. He really doesn't want to grow. If you want to grow, if you are studious in God, and you know that your life, your very life and excess depend on this word, then you will take notes. And you won't use just any notes, like jotters. All those things you can easily throw away or piece of papers. You go and buy a special book or a diary or something precious and take your notes there. Sundays, Wednesdays, Sundays and Wednesdays. The notes I used 30 years ago, 35, no, 32 years ago, thereabout, and upwards. All of them are with me at home. Everything. And I still consult them. There are some things I'm looking for sometimes. 
I go back to those notes. Notes I've used 1990, 1991, 1992. So you need to understand why you should take notes in church. You should be able to have from January to December last year the notes you took in church. To make reference to them. Hallelujah. Because you don't know where God is taking you. Apart from the fact that you need it for your spiritual life, your personal life, to grow. Because the word of God is first of all for your personal life before it becomes a ministry to other people. So we are not asking you to take notes because you will need to preach to people. We are asking you to take notes because you need to grow. This is your food. This is what you eat in the spirit realm. The words have I found and I did eat and it became unto me a joy and rejoicing. What that means is that when I, found, when I found that word, then it brought result and became a testimony and then I become joyful. Every result you are going to have in life will take their source from the word of the living God. Amen. Hallelujah. This is why you come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. And even Sundays and Wednesdays are not enough. You need to still be able to to study on your own and develop. Please let me hear myself more here. I need a little more, more for you. Alright, the way to the cross. That's what we are looking at this morning. Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 to 39 says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. It's, it's not a, a statement of speculation. It's almost like a conclusion. If you will not take your cross and follow me, then you are not worthy of me. You are not worthy of my blessing, of my favor, of my visitation, of my manifestation. If you cannot or will not take your cross and follow after me. He that taketh not. So we see first of all that it is something to take. There's something you have to pick up. The responsibility is on you and not on God. God will not pick up your cross for you. Is somebody with me? What God is going to do, he has done. And that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and I. And now you have to pick up your cross and follow after Jesus. God will not help you carry your cross. You have to take it by yourself. Secondly, God is not going to force you. He won't. He's not going to force you. Jesus is only informing you here of the reality of not taking the cross. That if you don't take your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of me. I am worthy of my presence, my blessings. And then it says in that same verse, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me. Meaning that you are not supposed to take the cross and sit down. You are not supposed to take the cross and go to sleep. You are not supposed to take the cross and start a party. You are not supposed to take the cross and just stay somewhere, you are supposed to take the cross and then what? Follow. Come on, shout follow. Come on, say I am a follower. Amen. Say I'm not just a spectator. I'm a follower. Hallelujah. So you pick up your cross and follow. I would like to read this for us in Amplified Version because Amplified Bible will always amplify the verse for you. Helping you to understand what the verse 
uh, is saying more by adding more synonyms and all that. So let's look at amplified version of Matthew chapter 10, 38 to 39 to give us a more understanding of what the scripture is trying to say here. He who does not take up his cross and follow me, that is, cleave steadfastly to me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come. You, come. Now, come, come. If I'm just going to hold him, maybe I just hold him like this. Okay. Hold him. I'm just holding him. Okay. But it says, he that cleaves steadfastly. It's like, you can't go nowhere. We're together. That's the picture in the Amplified Version. Is somebody with me? You cleave steadfastly, passionately. It's about your life. It's, it's your priority. That's what you are concerned about. Cleave steadfastly to me. Then it says, conforming wholly to my example in living. Conforming wholly to my example in living. And if need be, dying also. And that's the part we don't like, really. But it's, it's trying to tell you what it means to follow. And it's not just some passive followership, okay? Come to church once in a month. Read your Bible once in two weeks. Go to church when you feel like. Or when they send a the bus to pick you, there's no bus, you're going nowhere. Mix up. Some people dress up, come up, go, no bus, and then go back to their room. <laughs> You're not cleaving steadfastly. Is somebody with me? And then it says, such person is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his lower life will lose it. That is, lose the higher life. And whoever loses his lower life on my account will find the higher life. Hello, somebody. Okay. I'm going to read two more translations to bring the meaning to us. In the message translation, he says, If you don't go all the way with me. Come on, say all the way. All the way. Have you ever been in a relationship before and you just know that this guy... Or this lady with whom you are in love is not going all the way with you. This person is not playing to you. Looks like this person is hiding something. Looks like this person is not really, you know, uh, doing what he's supposed to do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. You have to be willing to go all the way. Because I'm very complex. You have to be willing to go all the way. Come on, somebody say all the way. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you don't go all the way with me, through what? I can't hear you. Through what? Thick and thin. You don't what? Oh my God. You don't deserve me. And you know, if somebody doesn't deserve Jesus or deserve God, that means the person doesn't deserve any blessing, favor, grace, increase, promotion, open doors, jobs, opportunities. If you don't go all the way. So, you see, Christianity is not something you do halfway, it's not something you do passively. Now let's just do it one step in, one step out. I don't really want to be a serious Christian. I just want to be, you know, a church goer. You can't get anywhere in God like that. Is somebody following me? You have to go all the way. Come on, somebody say all the way. Okay, Lord, I submit my life. I submit every area of my life except in this area. You are not going all the way. When I was young, when I was young, when I was on campus, and it was 400 level, and I began to pray about God's purpose for my life. What will you have me do? What's the next thing I'm going to do? And all I kept having was having visions and dreams and revelations. I mean, I was just an 
ordinary church goer like you. I, there was nothing to say I was going to be a pastor. I could just be, I'm just pastor. In fact, some of you are more committed than I was at that, at that time. I was just, you know, I was just like that. I never knew I was going to end up in ministry. Even though my mom, when I was 14, before she passed away, went up to be with the Lord, told me categorically, he said, you will be a pastor. And I told her, no, I want to be a businessman. Just like Jonah might say, you know, you ask him what does he want to say, businessman. <laughs> I told my mom, no, 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 I will be. He said, ah, now you don't know. It has been covenanted. You'll be a pastor. I didn't understand the word covenanted. He said, but he said that. And you will be a pastor. So, in the university, there was not in the show I was going to be a pastor. In fact, my hundred level, I had to go to fellowship. Sunday morning, I'll be in my room. I, was, I just wasn't interested. I was cold. Then after a while, when I began to pray about what God will have me do, I began to see dreams and visions. Guess what? If you ever pray about what God will have you do and you're beginning to see dreams, see yourself preach, oh, congratulations. Don't help you. Listen to me. You want to hear me say something? You can't escape it. You have you heard what I just said? You heard me? Let me tell your neighbor, you can't. It's like the two books that Chino Achebe wrote. The four, he wrote the first one things for the power, right? Second one was uh, what is it? The arrow of the Lord. Arrow of God. When the arrow of God points at you and you want to dodge it, things will fall apart. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Unless the call of God over your life is not vital. If it is vital, God will demand that you go all the way with him. He won't leave you to rest until you do that which he's asking you to do. Anybody following me? This is the reason why in church you should allow yourself to be discipled. To be discipled. To learn all you can learn. Is somebody following me? And stop playing some hanky panky, you know, just do you go to church and you will say, Why are you not coming to church this morning? They didn't call me. Who's going to call you? Why are you not going to church today? Oh, the, that church did not visit me. Who, who have you visited? You have to grow up. And our generation, you know, our generation, this generation, this generation is a spoiled generation. Growing up on campus as a student, who will come and pick you on campus? Nobody does that. They will come with bus to pick you. No. You trek to church. And if you say, okay, I don't have I don't have money to go to church, you don't see them because of that. Inside the lane, you are running to church. There was passion. These days, people dress up, come out of their of their hall, bus, they have no bus, then they go back. Go back right in. What a generation. What a generation. And so I began to have these dreams and revelations. And I really wanted to escape. I really wanted to escape. I didn't, I didn't want it. I didn't understand the fullness of it. I'm like, Pastor, how? Pastor Bao. There are some of you that say, I do I see you're gonna be a pastor while you do like this. See, do this thing 10 million times. And some, some people say, I will ensure I don't marry a pastor. I want to marry an engineer. And then you marry an engineer, and then one year later, the engineer becomes pastor. You don't. Hello, somebody. Hello, sir. I wanted to escape, but I couldn't. I couldn't find a way of escape. I remember. One day I was in my room meditating on all those dreams and visions and my pastor on campus visited me and I was telling him about those dreams I was relating to him. And then he looked at me and said, you are called. I said, what do you mean you are, I'm called? 
which for him is MTN or Yate. I said, that was the first time I was hearing you are called. Called, but who is calling me? And then he began to break it down. He said, the calling of God is upon your life. I said, ah, you know what I did next? I wept. I was crying. He called me my business. That <laughs> because I didn't understand. Every attempt to negotiate myself out of things, the next day God is showing me another revelation. So myself preaching in churches, in seminars, in crusades. I even saw myself preaching with my wife sitting on the stage behind me, and I'm not yet proposed to her at that time. That's how intense those dreams were. She was wearing a red gown, sitting down. It was too clear. There was something I could do. At the time, after becoming a pastor, the school went on strike. About eight months. You know, in those days, it used to be stroke. This one is strike. Past tense of strike. I mean, at the advance of strike, the stroke. Everything paralyzed. Eight months, nine months. We come back to school, we are like, you have forgotten everything. On only days, people go and get jobs. Driver, dry cleaner, all kind of jobs. Because nine months, you that you know you, you, you can't play football before, you return as a goalkeeper. <laughs> After nine months. So the, the, the students are working, and I was pastoring students. Nobody was around. Second month, third month, fourth month, I said, ah. I've tried. Packed my bags and left for Lagos. Went to look for a job. Within two weeks, I got a job in the school and I was going to be paid ten times what I was being paid as, as a pastor. I said, this is it. This is what we're talking about. So on the day I was supposed to go and resume at that workplace, I dressed up in a dream. The night before. Some I said in a dream. So I was I dressed up, picked my bag, and I was going to resume in that school. I lighted the school was on island. I, I lighted and walked down then just to negotiate the street on we, where that school was. As soon as I turned like this, what I saw were three dogs. Very big, wild looking, growling dogs. At least I could recognize a bulldog. The other ones, I don't know their names. They were growling and looking at me. Obviously, in that dream, they didn't want me to pass. So I waited. My plan was when these dogs are tired, they will leave so I can pass and go and resume the job. But they waited there, they were growling. They were getting agitated. You know what dogs do when they want to attack? They were doing that. And I was thinking, should I go back? Should I stay? <laughs> These dogs are doing. As I was trying to make up my mind, maybe I should step back. Those dogs came for me in my dream. They came for my knees. And I just woke up. You know how you how you wake up when they start? Bam. So when I woke up, I picked up my Bible. When I opened that Bible, my eyes fell and riveted to a particular verse, beware of dogs. Ha! Huh. And then God spoke to me. He said, if you take that job, dogs will eat you up. In the Bible, the dogs, are, uh, unbelievers are likened to dogs. You remember this Syrophoenician woman who wanted her, her daughter healed and Jesus Christ said, uh, uh, the healing is for the children, not for the dogs. And she said, no, but the dogs can eat of your crumbs. So God was telling me, if you take this job, this and this will happen. So I got the, I got, I got the lesson clearly. I just took my bag and left back for my station. Because there was a vital call of God upon my life. There was an assignment he has for me. Now, you won't be able to, f to locate your assignment or do what he has called you to do if you don't follow completely. Are you with me? Are you with me? That message transition says how you have to go all the way. Come on, let me tell your neighbor all the way. Tell your neighbor not halfway. How many of you would like to eat rice that is half cooked, halfway cooked? 
or beast that is halfway cooked. It's punishment. It's not that food is not available. It's that the person you ask to cook does not know how to cook. So the beans was done halfway, still had the palm oil and everything is there, not be able to eat. Will you be able to eat that? Or steel that is halfway cooked. No fish, no meat, just pepper. Hello, somebody. Believers ought to go all the way so that your blessings can be complete in Him. Are you with me? Are you with me? So he says in message translation, if you don't go all the way with me, through think and thin, you don't deserve me. If, you for, if your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. I mean, that's categorical. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you will never find yourself. Let me explain what it means by saying you will never find yourself. Now, in God, we are all prosperous. We all have a glorious destiny. We are all wealthy in God. All we are doing to get to that place of wealth, that place of prosperity, that place of peace, is to walk in the plans and the purposes of God for our lives so that we can get to that place. Is to obey Him, follow the script, and do what He wants us to do, and then we'll get to the place we need to get to. But he's saying here, if you leave me or ignore me while you are trying to tidy up yourself and do your stuff, he says you will never find yourself. That is, you will never find that place in God, that true prosperity, that place of true wealth. In God, in God, everybody is wealthy. Because God does not create mistakes. Everybody is blessed. But now you now have to discover why God created you. Is somebody with me? And then follow that plan. And then you will always be able to find your wealth. There is, there is a man, I forgot his, his name, in no, in no sin or in no sin, I forgot his name, but he makes cars in Nigeria. SUV, some kind of cars, he manufactures those cars. I'm not talking of bringing parts and assembly, no, I'm not talking of an assemblage. He, he does them. You will know that that is what God created them to do. Your place of wealth, prosperity, fulfillment is in the place of why am I here? And when, where it gets interesting is sometimes the course you are running in school is far away. Or the course you read in school is far, far away from what God is asking you to do. So there was this guy who was a medical doctor and on the day he graduated, he called him on stage, gave him his certificate, and he was crying all the way. And then they asked him to respond, and then he called his parents up and presented them the certificate. And said, this is your certificate. I've done what you want me to do. Have it. Now I'm free to do what I really want to do. I really want to sing. Is somebody with me? Now the idea is not to jump out of school or abandon school if you find out it's not in the land of your purpose. But it's to give yourself self-development in the area of what God has created you to become so that you can mature into the reality of his dream and his purpose for your life. That is where prosperity and abundance and fulfillment is. And you have a responsibility of finding out why am I yeah. And one of the ways you find that out is to look at what you enjoy doing most. What brings you joy. What you do playfully that is like work to others. It's an indication of where, of what God has created you to be. Hallelujah. Alright, let's go on. In Let's read one more uh, version in contemporary English version. He says, unless you are willing to take up your cross and come with me, you are not fit to be my disciples. You are not fit. If you, if you don't pick up your cross and come with me, you are not fit. That is, it's like you, you, are, you want to enroll in the army. You really want to serve your country. You really want to be useful. And then you get there, you say, jump, climb, do this. And say, sorry, you are not fit. Go back home. God is saying here, 
And what makes you fit for him is for you to pick up a cross and follow him. To go all the way. Unless you're willing to take up your cross and come with me. You don't only pick the cross. You don't also go with him. He says, you are not fit to be my disciples. If you try to save your life, look at that. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. There's a guy, when I was on campus, the calling of God was upon his life. He was obviously called as a student. He was teaching storms that were beyond you know, his age. Tremendously used of God as a young person. Healings, all kind of manifest. You just know that God's call is upon this one because you know the Bible says this grace can be perceived. When you see somebody that is called, if you're a spiritual person, you know this person is called. But you know, he left the calling and went to do some other things. Business, do all kind of stores. And in a moment of time, there was money. They had money, bought cars, got a house. But it only lasted, all of those only lasted three years. In three years, there was a divorce. The car was gone. The house was gone. Back to frustration. Back to camp zero. Okay, God, all right now. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. But see, the question is, you don't need to waste your time. Waste 10 years playing around. To lose all of the things you've been playing around with, and then finally say, okay, 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 I really want to cooperate. Is somebody with me this morning? She so says, unless you are willing to take up your cross and come with me, you are not fit to be my disciple. If you try to save your life, you lose it. But if you give it up for me, you will surely, surely, surely find it. What he's saying is, if you try to go uh, do some other things, so this is what I want to do at the expense of what God is asking you to do. Which may not even be ministry now, it could just be any other thing, it could be some form of career. He says, You will lose it. He said, But if you lose your life for me, that is, abandon your ambitions and follow God. He said, You will find your life back. That is, that money you really wanted to pursue initially, you will find it. Are you still following me? The next question, quickly, is How do you take up your cross? Some of us may take up your cross, take up your cross. How do I take up the cross? What do I pick up? Let's look at it in the practical sense. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, look at what Jesus Christ said. He said, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me. Notice the scripture we first read says, If a man will not pick up his cross and follow. Another translation says, If you won't pick up your cross and come with me. Now Jesus Christ says here that if you will if any man will come after me, that is, if you really want to come after me, if you really want to follow me, like I said in the other verse where I said, pick up your cross and follow me. He's answering that, that, that here in Matthew 16, 24. If any man will come after me, will follow me, will cling steadfastly with me, listen, he says, let him what? Let him what? Is he not on the spring? Let him what? Deny himself. And then do what? Take up his cross and what? And follow me. So we see from this verse that taking up your cross simply means deny yourself. Deny yourself is taking the cross according to this verse. Let's follow quickly. It says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall what? Shall find it. Let's look at Amplified Version. Long verse, but let's listen. He said, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciples, let him deny himself. That is, disregard, lose sight of and forget himself and his own interests. And then take up his cross and follow me. That is, cleave steadfastly to me. Conform wholly to my example in living. And if need be, in dying also. 
For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort, and his security here shall lose it. That is the eternal life. And whosoever will lose his life, his comfort, and his security here for my sake shall find life everlasting. So we see here that picking up the cross is denying yourself, forgetting about your own interest. On a Sunday, on a Sunday morning, my interest, what I feel like doing, I want to sleep. But now, if I'm following him, if I'm if I've really picked up my cross, I deny that state. So I deny that interest. Dress up. Despite the fact that my flesh doesn't want to come to church, dress up, pick up my Bible, and go to church. That is following after. That is going all the way. A point in life that you come to that, Lord, it is not about me. It's about you. He that won't do this thing does not deserve me. That does not deserve my blessing, my favor, my promotion, my increase. My protect. He doesn't deserve it. So we see here that this denial is not something you do once. It's something you do every day. Come on, say every day. Come on, say every day. Luke chapter nine, verse twenty-three. And he said to them all, "If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross." What? His cross what? I can hear him. Shouting. He has to take up his cross daily. Every day. See, because the devil is trying you out every day. Your flesh is getting on your way every day. The Bible says after he tempted Jesus, and Jesus passed all the tests. The Bible says he left him alone for a season. Meaning that he went and then he came back again to try. The cross has to be picked up how many times a week? Every day. It's a continuous exercise. You can't do it once. He said, thank you Lord, I've picked up my cross since 20 years ago. No. You pick it up daily. If you pick it up once and you don't pick it daily, what will happen is that you have expired testimonies. Testimonies of 15 years ago. Testimonies of 10 years ago. When you were picking it, now that you don't pick it, nothing is happening. The world is going to be in your life. Ah, I remember 1973. Every time I remember 1974. What about now? It's a daily thing. Let me tell you, it's a daily thing. Just like you eat every day. Or is there anybody here who doesn't eat daily so that we can cast out the lying spirit? Every one of us eats every day. The way you eat daily. If you are from one side of the country, you eat pandedian daily. Every day, pandedian. But sometimes you eat pandedian in the morning, the afternoon, I say, how? You are supposed to pick your cross. Every day. Some of us, if we can pick up our cross passionately, like we pick up swallow when we are eating. Eh? You and you and Jesus Christ, you, you are so step, you are steadfastly together. Have you seen some people when they see food the way they mean? If if we just bring food here now, all these people that are packaging. The tempo and the atmosphere will just change. I know somebody. Tell your neighbor it's daily affair. Let me ask your neighbor, have you picked your cross today? Let's let's answer a few more questions. How do we take this cross daily? How, 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 how? In a practical sense. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the what? 
the things of the spirit. Look at that scripture. Those that are after the flesh do mind. So this thing is a thing of the mind. You don't pick your cross physically. Say, Pastor, I don't have a cross in my room. You know? But it's a battle of the mind. That's why this scripture says, they that are after the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh. Why exactly is God saying we should not go after the way of the flesh all the time? How many of us know we are all in the days of our flesh? Are we? Are we? Or is there an angel here? Angels are here. You not see them in our physical hands, but I'm talking to human beings right now. We are in the days of our flesh. That is why you continue to struggle with flesh. Somebody said, Lord God, prayer point two, take away this sensual feeling from my body. You're asking God to kill you. That's what you're asking for. Oh Lord, I, I pray. I don't want to, I don't want to be tempted with any sin again. Just stop it forever. Yes. What your prayer in interpretation is, Lord, kill me now. Let me die now. Because as long as you are human and you are in the days of your flesh, you will still have to struggle with the flesh. You will still have to decide between the flesh and the spirit. Anybody with me? Okay? You are fasting. God told you fast for seven days. You made up your mind to fast. You are ready. Fasting began. 11 o'clock. Your roommate, as if it's the devil that sent you, start cooking beans. Me fully that beans is your weakness. When you see beans, your leg begins to shake. Your leg begins to have fellowship with each other. begins to cook. And when the woman starts cooking the beans, you are okay. You are managing your professor's scripture. Thank you, Lord. I'm not big this fast. I'm fasting. Then, she added Maggi. Ah. The way you add Maggi to beans, the, 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 <laughs> the aroma will change levels. I know somebody. And then you say, God, you know I'm a human being. I'm in the days of my flesh. I have tried, but God, let me break my fast day by level. You just allow the flesh to win over. Is somebody with me? Oh, I feel like having sex. I want to have sex. Everybody feels like having sex. Everybody, every human being. At one point or the other. Bible Paul says, put your body under. Because if you don't put your body under, your body is going to get into serious troubles. Serious troubles you won't be able to handle. So look at your Bible. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So this means there are things of the flesh. Abi? And there are things of the spirit. Those that are after the flesh they mind the things of the flesh. That is to say, the things of the flesh are important to them. Those that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. That is, the things of the spirit are important to them. What are the things of the flesh? You know, sometimes the flesh is not a sinful thing. It's just that it can dissipate the anointing, waste your strength. It's not sinful. For example, Sitting down to watch a season film from 9 a.m. in the morning to 9 p.m. in the evening is not a sin. Is it a sin? It's not a sin. But that's works of the flesh. If you have not prayed 10 minutes in that day, you don't even pray for 10 minutes. Don't let, don't let, don't let us even say one hour. You've not prayed, you've not opened your Bible, you woke up in the morning, the first thing you did is to get your laptop and you start watching film. You not talk to God. You are minding the things of the flesh. 
What are the things of the Spirit? Reading your Bible, praying in the Holy Ghost, confessing God's scripture, meditation on God's word. See, there are things of the flesh, there are things of the Spirit. Now you ask yourself, which one am I actually minding? Because the next verse I'm going to show you is very serious. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. He says, for to be carnally minded. Because when you, are, when you mind the things of the flesh, you are carnally minded. He said, to be carnally minded is what? No, say it. Say it, say it. Is what? Shout it, let me hear. Is what? Death. And so somebody says, but I've been carnally minded and I'm not dead, I'm alive. He's not really talking about physical death. Physical death is part of it, but it's not so much of physical death. It's the death of Blessings, favor, an open doors, an increase, and opportunities. Death of experiencing what it means to be in the presence of God. Because when you mind the things of the flesh, there's no way you will cultivate the presence of God. And everybody needs to learn how to cultivate the presence of the Lord so that you can hear him. Because your productivity in life at the end of the day depends on how much you can hear God. To be carnally minded is death. Something is dying. Some of you need to do those Instagram videos. Okay? To be carnally minded is what? Someone increase one opportunity dies every time you are carnally minded. Then it says, But to be spiritually minded is what? Life. Life and peace. How many people want peace? How many people want the life of God? Peace. Peace means shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Everything is just rounded for you, everything just works fine for you. Everything is just beautiful for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at Amplified Version of Romans 8, verse 6. Now the mind of the flesh is talking to us. He's trying to explain what it means to mind the things of the flesh. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. That is what that is kind of, to be kind of the mind. Sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Now, sense and reason are good. You need it. You need to be sensible. You need to have reason. But it says being kind of minded is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. So it says here, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit is death. Death. Listen, which death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. It's trying to de define that death for you. But it said, we carnally minded is death. What is the thing dying? How does the person die? He said, this is death that comprises of all kinds of miseries, things that make you cry, weep. Things that happen and you're like, this is not supposed to happen to me as a believer. Why is this happening? Why should this happen to me? Why should I go through this loss? Why should I be slowed down? Why should why should I not have enough money, enough supply? I read the Bible. The Bible says that God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But right now I'm just in constant lack and insufficiency. Is death that arises. From all these miseries, miserable life that a believer is living, a believer that is supposed to live in royalty, with everything available for you as a child of God, begins to live a life of misery because that believer is carnally minded. He says, For the mind of the Holy Spirit is life. Come and say, Life. 
and so peace both now and forever. Let me show you one more verse as I close. Why is God saying we should not be carnally minded? I've answered that a little bit. We know that uh, it brings death. But let's see one more scripture in verses 7 to 8. The reason why God is saying we should not be carnally minded. Is he on the screen? Is he on the slide? Okay, let's read together. Want to go because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now, 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 now. I didn't hear anybody. So let's lift up our voice and read together. Want to go. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh and please God. Now listen. Let's break it down. The reason why God says you should not be carnally minded, He says, because the carnal mind is an enemy of God. Oh Lord Jesus. That's not to scare you. That when you are constantly carnally minded, it's hard to get anything from God. It's enmity. So, what does an enemy do? What, what will an enemy do at most times? He will oppose, isn't it? He will oppose, he will fight. So what the carnal man does, when God wants to bless you, the carnal man says, no! I don't, no! I don't want no blessing here. I don't want any favor. I don't want that open door. No, 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 it can't happen. No, I don't want that supply. That is what the carnal mind does. So you see why a lot of believers are frustrated. Say, I go to church, I pray, I pay my time, but <laughs> are you still kind of minded? Some things are dying and you don't know. And the interesting thing is that those things that are dying, you might just think it's because of the economic environment. It's because of the recession in town. <laughs> the covenant we have with God supersedes the economic situation of the environment. Is somebody with me? Our supply system is not how the economy is. What the economy is needing is irrelevant. For my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches. Did they say according to Nigerian situation? According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But now it's telling us that the carnal mind is an enemy of God. Why? He said because it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Don't consider that okay, maybe God will consider it. He said neither indeed can be. Then he now concludes in a very sober way. So then, come on say so then. Okay. Anywhere you see the Bible says so then. It's concluding for you. That don't argue this one. Come on say so then. Okay. <laughs> so then they that are in the flesh cannot what? Cannot what? He didn't say may not. Can not. However they try. Let them sleep inside church from morning to evening. They cannot please God. And if you cannot please God, it means you are not in faith. Because the Bible says it is impossible. Hebrews 11 6. It's possible to please God without faith. It is impossible. They that are in the flesh, if you are always listening to your flesh, your flesh is always lording it over you. You can please God. Look at the message translation. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God. Ends all thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing. I mean, when somebody has ignored what God is doing, how does the person get blessed? God is trying to bring some blessing. The person ignores him by virtue of a carnal minded you know, car carnal mindedness. And then he says, God isn't pleased at being 
ignored. Verse 13 of Romans chapter 8. Look at it. It tells us what we, what we should now do with the flesh. Well, it's not the next question. Right? Are you with me? Okay, let's assume I'm done. The, the flesh is always trying to wash light with the flesh. See it in the next verse. For if you live over the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit, come on, say through the spirit. What's the next thing it says? Do mortify the deeds of the body. You shall live. What is mortify? Who can tell me? What does mortify mean? If you're medical doctors, you know what mortification is. When it says, oh, the body is born to that state of mortification, that means it's dead. To mortify means to kill, destroy, can't live again. So what the Bible is telling us here, <laughs> you through the Spirit, you should mortify the deeds of the body. That is when you can live. What are the deeds of the body? It's listed somewhere in the scriptures that the works of the flesh are manifest, adultery, fornication, glutinous, uh, uh, idolatry, all of them are there. Drunkenness, works of the flesh. He says, but what you have to do is to mortify these deeds. But notice it says, through the Holy Spirit. So it's not something you can do on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to mortify. That is, you take the flesh to the mortuary. You mortify it. Once the dead man gets to the mortuary, it's considered gone. Over. The person died, oh, well, that was revival, oh, he is dead. In the next place is mortuary. It's mortuary. On the way to the grave. He said, that's the way you have to deal with this flesh. Otherwise, the flesh will mortify you. So that you mortify the flesh, you allow the flesh to mortify you. When the flesh mortifies you, you are just there. You know, somebody can, can die at the age of 30 and be buried at 65. He's dead long past by reason of the flesh. So mortify these deeds. Oh, I feel like having said, mortify! Kill it! No, you are not having that. No way. Get up from your room, get into the get outside and see whether that body will have control over you. Let's see whether you fornicate on the road in front of Bodhija. Yeah, the thing is on me. I have to sleep, I have to have sex now. You get out. It's a body you see. Your body will normalize. The problem is that you are not ready to take it to the mortuary. When you are not ready, each time your body will load it over you. Each time the body load it over you, something dies in your life. Oh, something dies. Abraham and Lot were together. The destiny of Lot was tied to Abraham. But at the time, Lot says, uh, Abraham said, okay, choose one. And, and Lot took a decision and left Abraham. Many years after, he was in serious trouble. It was this same Abraham that went back to help him out. Come on, say mortify. Come on, say mortify. Somebody says, oh, pastor, if I'm in a room with a babe, and the babe has already removed her clothes, and I've already removed my trouser, and I've already gone through, I've, like somebody said, I've passed through the land of no return. How do I mortify the deeds at that stage? She has removed her blouse, she has removed her skirts, everything is naked, she's already touching my body. I said, there's nothing like land of no return. He said, Pastor, you don't understand. It's because you're a pastor. I mean, she has removed her clothes. I said, I will tell you how you can mortify the deeds of the flesh. Or how the deeds of the flesh can be mortified. So, 
But what he was trying to say is that once you get to that stage, there's nothing anybody can do again. Fornication will take place. And he said, all you, all you need for your sense to return is for the girl to say she's HIV positive. The next thing is that you are looking for your trust. Meaning that you can actually control your flesh. I say, it's the devil. It's the devil. You see, the devil will cry on the judgment day. When you people are lying. This is the devil. They will say, me. I was not there. I help you to lock the door. I'm the one that removed your bed. Don't lie against me. Because we blame everything on the devil. You for the case, it's the devil. Yeah, it's the devil. Yeah, it's the devil. Why can't the devil push you to go and slap a loop on the road? Why is the devil always pushing you to do things like fornication, stealing somebody's money? Why is the devil selecting? See, it's, the, it's your flesh. It's not the devil. You are dressing up to go and meet somebody in a guest house. You say it's the devil. Eh? The devil bow for you in the bedroom. Then he said, this is the dress you should wear. Then the devil said, use perfume. No, the devil is not that powerful. You do what you wanted to do. You allow the flesh to take over. Listen to the people of God. Listen to this statement. It's a very heavy statement. If you continue to be carnal minded and allow your flesh to dictate to you, you will never be able to enjoy the fullness of God's blessing only be crumbs here and there because of his messes. But if you really want to get to that place where God will say, well done, you have to kill the flesh. Everybody you admire that got up there in the faith have to go through the process of killing the flesh. I'll round up by just reading two more translations of Romans 8 13 and then I'll round up. Amplified version of Romans 8 13 says for if you live according to the dictates come on say dictates how many of us did dictation in school in primary school especially dictation we are right this right that so the flesh must have a voice isn't it because now he said the dictates of the flesh. Are you with me? So when the, when the voice comes in, they tweet that you know that and you know it's wrong. That's the flesh dictating to you. And you have a, a responsibility to say no. It's like somebody selling orange. She can't force you to buy orange, can she? Hello? She's selling orange. Oh, buy oranges. These oranges are sweet. Say, orange seller, come, come, come. You see, you saw the oranges. It's fresh. Let's represent like that as we call it. Say, come, come. Say, how much is these oranges? Say, negotiation. Negotiation. The orange seller can say, you must buy. No, it's your decision. That's what happens when the flesh dictates to you. It's trying to negotiate with you. You see that you buy it, but you refuse to buy it. Are you with me? If you live according to the dictates of the flesh, what's the next statement? Say it to don't say it. You will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are what? Take note of that word. You are what? Say it loud. It's very important. Say it louder. Louder. If by the Holy Spirit you are habitually put to death. It's an everyday thing. It's not a once and for all exercise. You are habitually put into death. You are being tempted every day with several things. The Bible says every man is tempted uh, of his own uh, weakness. We have different weakness. 
good cases. Every man. Sometimes what is a temptation is not another man's. But everybody will be tempted. Everybody has a weakness. Some people, their weakness is a green bottle. You can't cite alcohol. Your eyes will be rolling inside the socket. If a person who does not make that sell those things, even if you are driving, you want to park. Some people, their weaknesses are women. Anything in skirt, even if it's a goat in skirt, he's going this way before. On a serious business appointment, sees one girl, forgets about the appointment, start following. Start following. When Jesus Christ to take your cross and follow me, you are following me. Whether you like it or not, you are following something. You're not following your flesh, you're following Jesus. You say, cross, cross. I'm born again, or cross. Hmm? Stay under the bed, yeah. I can't pick you every day. Do you want my own cross? Cross, stay here. Eh? I'll be back. Let me just go for this party. That's what most people do. And Jesus Christ said, if you can't pick up a cross and follow me, they are not worthy of me. They are not there yet. They are just wasting time. This is a strong message. It's a message of discipleship, of a place of growth. And we all have to leave this baby stage and grow up. That is the only place, that is the only time you can experience the fullness of God in your life. I want the best of God for you. But you have to grow up. Apostle Paul said, oh, these people are still carnal. I can't feed them with meat. They can only take milk. So he says, you are habitually putting the dead and making extinct and deadening the evil deeds prompted by the body. Can you see that? He said, you shall surely, you shall really and genuinely live forever. Let's stand upon the feet. Amen. I'm not done with the teaching, but we have to stop here because of our time. Can we stand up? Can we stand up?